Drawing Out the Facts, the Naked Science Scrapbook. Hello and welcome to the Naked Science Scrapbook from the Naked Scientists. This time we're answering the question, how is cheese made? If, like me, you're a fan of cheese, you'll agree that there's almost no meal that it doesn't go well with. Perhaps for this reason, humans have been making cheese for thousands of years, and today there are hundreds of different types. But how is it made? Let's take cheddar as an example, which is a hard cheese that originated in cheddar in England at least 800 years ago, but is now made all over the world. The main ingredient for making cheese is milk. And for most cheeses, including cheddar, this means cow's milk, although goat, sheep and even buffalo milk are used too. And we're talking a lot of milk here. One pint makes just 56 grams of cheddar, roughly the amount that you'd put in a generous sandwich. The cheesemaking process starts off with a big vat of pasteurised whole milk. The first stage is called souring. A bacterial culture is added that feeds on the lactose sugar in the milk and converts it to lactic acid, making the milk sour. Different bacterial cultures give individual cheeses their unique characteristics. Swiss cheeses, for example, like Emmental, are full of holes because the bacteria added to those breathe out carbon dioxide gas that accumulates inside and creates the holes. Souring the milk helps with the next phase, coagulation. The soured milk is heated to around 30 degrees Celsius and an enzyme called rennet is stirred in. Rennet causes the proteins in the milk, called caseinogens, to coagulate or clump together into a form called casein. This starts to separate out from the watery whey as solid curds. Rennet is actually obtained from the stomachs of calves. They use it to coagulate the milk from their mothers and historians have suggested that early people may have stumbled on its action when they used calf stomachs to store milk. This would have split into curds and whey, explaining how cheese was first accidentally discovered somewhere in Europe or the Middle East up to 8,000 years ago. This means that cheese made using this traditional rennet isn't vegetarian. Fortunately, forms of rennet made from plants are now available, so cheese-loving veggies can still get their fix. Once the curds have set, they're cut into pieces using a set of wire knives resembling a rake. The smaller the pieces the curds are cut into, the more whey is released, which ends up producing a harder finished cheese like cheddar. After the curds have been cut into pieces, the heat is then turned up to 40 degrees and the curds are cooked. The whey is then drained off and the curds are cheddared, which involves stacking up blocks of curds to allow more whey to drain out. The curds are then milled into small pieces and mixed with salt, which plays an important role in determining the final flavour of the cheese. The mixture is now ready to be put into the moulds to be shaped into the finished cheese. Weights are applied to press the cheddar and drive out more water. If cheese isn't pressed, it'll have a more open, soft texture like the Italian cheese Pecorino. After being pressed overnight, the cheese is turned out of the moulds and left until the surface dries out in a room kept at 15 degrees C. It's then kept in a cooled room at around 8 degrees C to mature, and it's during this phase that the flavours develop. These are produced by a combination of the bacterial culture added at the start, which continues to break down the proteins and sugars in the milk, and the humidity and temperature at which the cheese is matured. For cheddar, maturation takes around three months, but some cheeses are aged for much longer. So that's the basic cheesemaking process. But what about blue cheeses like Stilton and Gorgonzola? How are they made? These cheeses contain characteristic blue veins, and both these and the strong smell and taste of the cheeses are produced by penicillium moulds growing on and in the maturing cheese. These moulds are actually close fungal relatives of the same mould used to make the antibiotic penicillin. But in the case of blue cheese, a species called Penicillium roqueforti, which was originally discovered in caves near Rockfort in France, or Penicillium glaucum are used. In Stilton, the Penicillium mould is added right at the beginning of the process, alongside the starter culture of lactic acid-producing bacteria. This means the mould is present throughout the cheese. The cheese-making process continues as before, but this time the cheese isn't pressed. 
This allows plenty of air spaces to remain in the cheese to allow the mould to grow. After they've been ageing for six weeks, holes are poked in the sides of the Stiltons using sterilised steel needles. This introduces extra air to keep the penicillium mould growing and helping to form the characteristic and strongly flavoured blue veins. There are many more alterations and additions to the basic cheesemaking process, as many as there are varieties of cheese. The type of milk, how the curds are cut, how much salt is added, where and how long the cheese is aged, all impact on flavour and texture. Some cheeses are covered in wax like Edam, or sprayed with a mould culture like Brie and Camembert, wrapped in nettle leaves like Cornish Yarg, or even bathed in alcohol, which gives the orange rind and pungent smell of epoisse. P.U. Now, if you'll excuse me, all this talk of cheese has made me want to go and have some. That's it for this time. To get the answers to more science questions, join us online at thenakedscientist.com forward slash scrapbook. Bye.